The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to today's webinar entitled Tackling the Trends of the 2022 State of Facilities in Higher Education. My name is Billy Zadig, Manager of Special Projects for APA. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. The webinar recording will be posted to the APA website later this afternoon. Please visit the APA website for archived webinars that are available to everyone for continuing education credits recognized by local, state, and federal professional entities. Professional continuing education and AIA CLU certificates are being offered for today's program. If you are an AIA professional, please send an email to me at billie, B-I-L-L-I-E, at APA.org, along with your AIA membership number if you've not done so in the past. Those who indicated they wanted a certificate of registration and meet the requirements will receive certificates later this afternoon. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Please type your questions in the chat box and they will be answered in the order they are received. If we run out of time and we still have questions, responses will be sent directly to the person asking the question by one of our presenters. If you're just calling in, make sure you send an email to me at billy at appa.org so I can send you a certificate if you requested one. The system only recognizes you if you log in. At this time, it's my pleasure to turn this over to Pete Zarah. Pete, take it away. Thank you, Billy, and welcome all to the Spring 22 webinar for the release of our ninth State of Facilities in Higher Education. And particularly uh, welcome to anybody who over the last several days has been struggling with the extraordinary weather that's been hitting uh, parts of the southern part of the country. Uh, and a special thank you to Marion, who was uh, at the center of that overnight. So uh, good to see you, Marion. Um, we're going to do things a little differently this year uh, with only a small glimpse into the document and then more of a conversation with our panel. Speaking of which, I'm delighted to be sharing this conversation today with Cindy and Marion and Lander. I uh, asked them to join in part because I think each of them has something pretty valuable to share where, about where things are today. And because I happen to just think that they're all terrific people and I'm looking to, forward to spending an hour with you. So um, if, uh, if I could ask each of you to, uh, to introduce yourselves and maybe share uh, maybe your tenure, where you are, um, if relevant, maybe a couple of previous experience, work experience, things you think might be interesting and perhaps something interesting you might want to say about your school or organization. Cindy, let's, uh, let's start with you. Certainly. Thanks, Pete. Um, so I'm Cindy Torstveit. I am the Associate Vice Chancellor of Facilities Planning and Management at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I've been with the university now for about three years in my current role, only a little over three months. So I'm fairly new. Um, but I have over 30 years of experience in facilities management, interior architecture, construction project management, and real estate. And I have both public sector and private sector experience. Um, I spent the last 15 years in government and higher ed. Uh, so, you know, I think I, I have a lot of a broad perspective as we talk about facilities here. Um, I want to give you a little bit about UW-Madison. Um, as many of you know, we're the flagship campus uh, within the University of Wisconsin system with a focus like many of you on education, research, and economic development. We've got a strong commitment to the Wisconsin and Wisconsin idea which is a principle that education should really influence people's lives beyond the boundaries of the classroom, and it guides us in everything we do. You know, that means that we're a tier one research institution, and we remain in the top 10 in national research spending. And, you know, that equates to approximately a patent or an IP disclosure a day. So therefore, you know, as we think about facilities and um, supporting both our academic and research mission is really important. And I'm really thankful to be about uh, to be included in this conversation today and talk about how we move forward. Awesome. Marion. My name is Marion Bracey. I'm Vice President for Facility Planning and Management at Xavier University of Louisiana. Uh, of course, Xavier University is a, a Catholic HBCU university, um, and we have many, many challenges, uh, one of which happened last night. And as we were talking, Lander reminded me of, uh, of a situation when I got an opportunity to present to uh, to APA out in Denver, I think it was, about uh, about the um, about problem. In, um, I'm, I'm getting a feedback. I apologize. I'm trying to work from two different areas here, but about problems as it relate to disasters and things of that nature. So 
Uh, last night, of course, we had a, a, a tornado to come through the New Orleans area. So we we're trying to manage through that today. But I'm extremely happy to be here. I'm extremely happy that that APA and other organizations, other partners actually give the platform so that individuals, especially peer institutions or like institutions or institutions that has pretty much some, nothing in common sometimes can just actually get together and share so that we won't have to continue to reinvent the wheel. We can come back, uh, you know, if, if something's working in, uh, for someone, say, uh, University of Texas at Austin, then maybe I can take that and all those larger university and where we are at Xavier, I can take that and I can customize it to fit what I'm doing. So this is the type of, of conversation that I'm happy to be a part of. And I'm just thrilled to death that, uh, that I was invited today. Thanks a lot. Welcome, Mary. And uh, Lander, for anybody who doesn't know who you are on this call, do you want to say hello and say something? I do, I do. Uh, I am president and CEO of APA. And yes, I have been around the block for a while. Uh, actually, nine on 28 years with APA alone, and 18, so start doing the math, hmm, at um, University of Maryland College Park. So I come out of facilities and into, uh, both chose to go into facilities the last 11 years of that stint, which for a female, Cindy, was pretty insane back then. <laughs> Loved every second of it and then wanted to go to APA to support it. Um, APA is the place where educational facilities professionals collect and connect. It's where we cultivate community and contribution that drive results. And frankly, um, we're all about collaboration as we move forward. Pete, we appreciate the opportunity to collaborate with um, Gordian, with you in particular, but with Gordian. Uh, period, great people and great work that you folks are doing, and also with Cindy and Marion. I've known Marion forever, I've not necessarily known Cindy for long, but they both come with so much to offer this community today because that is what APA is. We're about community and professional development, lowercase. And so you're going to hear a lot about what this community is up to um, from these two folks and Pete and what I can offer. Um, at uh, any given time. So back to you, Pete. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you. Um, and I'm Pete Zeroff from Gordian, and you'll hear more from me. Um, I want to say uh, to everybody, if you have questions throughout the day, uh, to the, the hour today, please enter those questions in your chat that will feed into our uh, our information, and we'll respond to those either throughout as appropriate or at the end of the session uh, as best we possibly can. Um, so moving forward, um, it's probably appropriate for anyone who doesn't know who Gordian is or what Gordian is. Gordian helps facilities and uh, finance leaders in higher education and actually some other parts of other businesses um, steward campuses across the full building life cycle, uh, from understanding condition and assessing care and investment strategies to estimating and procurement processes for construction. Um, the business brings data and technology with expertise to bear on enabling the best possible decisions and maximizing value and service of the mission of each of your unique organizations. The state of facilities document each year leans pretty heavily on the work in our facilities planning teams. Um, and it's where we pay special attention to the intersection integration of space, capital and operational silos uh, to try to steward and encourage effective uh, uh, stewardship on your campuses. So, um, today's conversation, we're going to dig quickly into some of the state of facilities findings and then have a conversation with our panel. Well, I hope we're coming out of a pandemic that's arguably been collectively the most uh, disruptive force during any of our lives. We're still going to focus, as always, on the bigger trends and the strategic ideas that are on the minds of people across the industry, including dealing with aging buildings, uh, space issues, uh, the role of technology, and um, absolutely the remarkable challenges that are coming from uh, the Great Resignation. Tomorrow, we will release the ninth edition of the State of Facilities. Um, it's actually available to anyone listening to this as a downloadable resource there in the little panel on the right-hand side of your screen. If we're honest, there are no secret revelations this year. Um, there's validation of what we've been experiencing of late, an affirmation that many of the questions and concerns we've been discussing over a period of time now are not only still present, but their urgency has been accelerated. If there is any good news that's come out of the pandemic, it's been the significant exposure that the leadership and decision-making skills that we all know is found within facilities offices have been given acts, has been given visibility across your institutions. 
facilities leaders continue to uh, to talk about the extent to which their voice has been heard and continues to be heard. And we know we want to keep championing uh, your collective use of that voice to make a difference on your campus because we know it can be so powerful. So let's talk about what's in this year's document. This should be a familiar image to anybody who's seen our work. This is the latest version of the inventory of space in our database, organized by construction date. And it continues to show the significant waves of new construction that peaked back around 1970, that other smaller but still significant peak across the early part of the century. And those two peaks are producing overlapping life cycle needs. Life cycle needs that are really gonna start to come together and compound in the late part of this decade and into the 2030s. That's profound because of the significant cost that that's going to represent to your institutions all at once. In a couple of slides, we're gonna talk about other forces that are gonna make it even more challenging. A little context on this image though, 53% of the square footage has in that, uh, in that blue wave, in those blue waves has been built since 1970. That's 113% growth since 1970. In 1970, there were 205 million people in this country and in 2020 census, that was 329. That's only a 62% growth, although so substantial. And as for 18 to 21 year olds, in 1970, there were 14.7 million. And in 2018 or 2020, that it, that it eclipsed, um, that it eclipsed uh, 17 million. So about 17 to 20% growth, significant difference. Now there are good reasons for that. Um, there's been significant expansion in research since that time. There's been significant expansion in athletic facilities on a lot of campuses. Um, and certainly, uh, not incidentally, the arrival of women to a lot of campuses in the 1970s brought changes uh, around gender issues. And there's been a tremendous expansion of residentiality at campuses. So there are lots of reasons why there has been more space, but the bottom line is there's a truckload more space uh, today than there was uh, just 50 years ago. Now, I also want to take a look at the realities of the pressure that we're talking about in terms of renovation age. Renovation age, for anybody who has not heard that phrase before, is the time since the last major renovation that reset the clock on all the major building systems. And in this graphic, um, it reveals the same pressure we saw indicated based on construction age. Growing numbers of buildings in the over 50 age category and another surge coming in that 10 to 25 year range that will soon be tripping into uh, needing their life cycles attended to on those major systems, both pressing for that investment that's going to create financial pressure on institutional resources. So it doesn't matter whether you've ignored your buildings or whether you've paid attention to them, you're still going to see that pressure coming on your campuses. Now, there have hardly been any conversations of late about the future of higher ed that didn't include some musings about Professor Graw's observations on enrollment going forward. Uh, he was actually featured on uh, Inside Higher Ed webinar just a couple weeks ago. This image is from his uh, 2021 book and shows the significant fall off in 18 year olds starting in the middle uh, of this decade. And he notes in his work as well that the pool of 18 year olds likely to want to go to college will be even lower, which is that dotted line, due to the demographic shift in the student population as we move forward and the composition of communities in our country continues to evolve. While the fall off is different for various schools and regions, the impacts are universal with some areas of the country and some school types starting to feel the pressure already today. I want to point out that the depths of that trough start to occur late this decade and into the 30s with Professor Graw's research ending around 2034. He didn't have available for his research some of the most current data. Um, this map runs from back in the 70s all the way to the present showing uh, birth rates in this country. And um, the scary news is that the downtrend that he was showing from starting in 2007 has continued for the last four years with a hopefully anomalous 4% drop in 2020 when the pandemic started, producing a 16.5% drop in birth rate since its peak in 2007, which is the lowest birth rate since the early 80s. Those additional four years would extend the downward trend on the previous graphic out to 2038. So remember what I said about life cycle needs were coming due in the 30s? We now have a significant capital need in the 30s, and we are also looking at the depths um, of, of a drop in uh, available students uh, to fill the seats on our campuses. All right, so even if a portion of that's impacting our campuses, that disconnect is going to be uh, a pretty big challenge. Astonishingly, our data continues to show the, the trend that's been happening for some time. 
space growth outpacing enrollment growth. Now, to be fair, if you're at an R1 research institution, we would agree with you that uh, your enrollment growth has been actually a little steeper than your space growth for a variety of reasons. But if you're at a regional public or a small liberal arts or one of the two-year uh, community colleges, you might be talking about campuses where enrollment growth is not just flatlined, it's actually gone negative um, and then enrollment's dropped. So the experience is different for everyone, but bottom line, in aggregate, we have more space than ever. In our report, we assert that this combination is more concerning than ever. And we have an even clearer timeline and one is going to feel, we're going to feel it most acutely as an industry um, for those that aren't already feeling it today. In, in truth, it might not be so troubling if we were in a solid position today with pristine campuses and all the money we needed to care for them all lined up. We could make some short-term changes to ride through the challenge and maybe settle into a slightly altered future. Um, the thing is, things aren't actually great. This graphic depicts the investment schools are making each year compared to an investment target that we establish for our members that outlines what's needed, a target to simply keep up and maintain the status quo. That's that red dotted line. Until the time of the recession, schools were actually doing a decent job of keeping up with that target. But the Great Recession changed all that. It was quickly clear that a shortfall had arisen. Now, laudably, schools have grown their investments back since then. In 2016, it was back to where it was in 2009. But realistically, realistically, um, they've only really done so at a pace that maintains the same shortfall um, with the growing demands of their campuses. It demands that arise simply over time, right? Entropy is still taking place and things are aging. But also from the ongoing expansion that we talked about in the previous slides, right? That we're growing the campus, which makes it harder and harder to keep up because you need more and more resources. Then the pandemic hit. If our preliminary data for 2020 is accurate, 2021 is accurate, and we have every reason to believe it is, then we're looking at another significant drop in investments to care for existing campus space. And while we're optimistic that there'll be a recovery of some kind, the trend is likely to be the same as it was after the recession, chasing a moving and increasing target. I'd love to report that our data shows more resilience in operating budgets, and there are some bright spots here. But broadly, our data is showing duress in operating budgets, similar if not quite as dire as that seen on the capital side. On the positive side, we've actually seen a steady plan maintenance increase across the entire duration uh, of this graphic. Um, as, as schools appear to be continuing their uh, embrace of a strategy that yields far more value than just reactive work. And energy spending has fallen of late, in part because activity has been reduced, but any success in that area is positive, and particularly for schools focused on carbon reduction. As it pertains to staffing, I want to be careful of this image, but we're sharing it. Our preliminary data reinforces the experience that many of you reported to us. There have been reductions in staff, some through what I'm going to call fiscal constraint, um, and some simply through departures that you just can't fill. You can't find someone to fill the empty slots from retirements or other you know, reasons to leave. But if the data holds up as we continue to scrub it, the loss in staff and the notable expansion in coverage is a very disturbing trend if we can't reverse it. Back in January, we supported APRA or collaborated with APRA in a survey of APRA members that yielded some fascinating information. Uh, the report of which you can find at that location, uh, that web location there on the bottom of the screen. Among so many interesting findings that you'll read about there, it revealed this brewing conflict, right? Expressions of enrollment challenges, budget reductions, and constrained operational staff, which you just heard me talking about. Despite all of that, nearly half of all schools indicated an expectation of growth in the next five years. That creates a real vice for anyone who's trying to lead an organization to care for and steward the physical campus. And if you don't have the resources to do it, and it keeps expanding or changing or growing or becoming more complicated for you, it's a really difficult position to be in. We wanted to do a quick poll for you. So you should uh, see on your screen, screen shortly several possible areas of uh, concern. I want you to please pick the area that you believe is your top area of concern. And Lander, I know you love these surveys for their real time truth, real time truth telling, right? They just you love the way these things work. 
So just click on the um, click on the area of concern, and then shortly, once uh, enough people have responded, we will pull up um, the uh, the results of that of that survey. Quiet time. We were. I will tell you. We were not really surprised by what we found in the survey findings um, when uh, we did them in January. They're not necessarily surprising issues, but we're curious to see if today's audience is um, reporting the same uh, the same results. So there, there they are. Lander, what do you think of all of that? Lander, are you still there? Yeah, I'm coming. Coming back to you, um, it's right on the money, is it not? I mean, that's exactly what we found um, in that survey. Um, just finding employees, whether they had the skill set or not, and then the budget um, sufficiency issue. Yes, enrollment did come in third some, and for masters and baccalaureate, we found that the physical campus that doesn't match your school's needs um, was clearly the third for them when we dissected it, Pete. So really great to get this from the folks that are um, in our community today because it just continues to reinforce um, what we found. Yeah, right. So if we flip back to uh, the findings from January, um, uh, exactly what you were just saying, Landra, right? That there they are. People, um, issues were absolutely number one, budget second enrollment. And interestingly enough, uh, back in January, the pandemic, uh, the way it was raging, the latest round um, with Omicron was raging, uh, certainly showed up as a presence more so than other items. So uh, very interesting. Nice to see that that correspondence is there and it's holding true with a different audience, uh, a different audience today. I wanted to close out this section of the um, uh, of the conversation today with a revisitation of an image that we have actually used over the last. Uh, year lander and I love it because it has no numbers on it, which seems almost oxymoronic for a data organization. But this was developed with our colleague Brian Harvey, uh, formerly in the planning office at the University of Massachusetts. And um, in it, he highlights um, he has highlighted a number of really important and significant trends. One is that we're going to see uh, an enrollment drop uh, sometime coming, that cliff that's going to hit, uh, and then soon after that, we're going to see some impact on revenue that will ultimately be negative. And we expect more so than ever that facility spending now at the bottom will drop off as well, uh, particularly now coming after the pandemic when people are going to be loath to take out financial pressures on the few people who are remaining or the people who are remaining who have helped to get them through to this point. And uh, in a search for students, financial aid is also going to be a tough spot. So we know facility spending is going to take a hit. One thing we know will continue to rise is the need coming from the existing facilities, which we've already described as growing. Now, the pandemic the pandemic certainly tweaked uh, the shape and we don't know what that shape looks like, but there was certainly a drop off in enrollment and uh, revenue and facility spending that has bounced back some for different uh, parties at different campuses. Um, but in general, uh, there has been a change in that curve uh, that we're gonna have to explore going forward. And the one truth we all share um, is that that facility spending will continue to go up unless we can find a way to alter that curve, unless we can find a different way right to think about limiting and curtailing spending or matching it in, in a new and innovative fashion so with that i would love to welcome my colleagues back for a series of questions in our panel conversation so uh cindy and marion and lander if you guys can jump back on welcome home um we're going to start off on a question about uh we didn't lose uh marion to uh more of the challenges of being in oh there he's back excellent Tornado didn't take you out again. That's good. Um, uh, we're going to talk about um, uh, the aging facilities first. Um, and I, I know we've all talked before about campuses aging, and despite the investment that schools are making in them, whether you're investing or not, they're just they're just aging. I want to ask all of you to talk a little bit about um, how that aging is manifesting. Uh, perhaps that's impacting uh, your buildings. Maybe they're failures or performance issues. Maybe it's impacting program because those failures or those challenges are impacting your ability to meet programmatic needs. Uh, maybe the that aging is impacting your student recruitment capacity, right? The buildings no longer match what you're trying to accomplish. I'm curious how the aging is manifesting and maybe what strategies are you implementing or are you hearing about to try to tackle the problem? Um, and Cindy, I'd love to put you on the hotspot first. 
Sure, thanks. Um, so, you know, this is a really significant issue at UW Madison. Um, you know, per the demo, the, the panel and the, the graphic you showed earlier, you know, when we looked at the renovation age of our buildings, we have about 40% that are over 50 years old, and then about another 20% are over 25 years old, which means we've got significant um, risk to our portfolio at about 60%. Um, and we're starting to really see how that's impacting our campus um, in terms of exterior envelope issues where we've got, you know, we've recently had some panels fall off of the building, um, mechanical, electrical, elevator, plumbing. And, um, you know, that's that's really been critical on our campus and how are we maintaining our facilities and how are we getting funding for those? You know, we're unique um, to many universities where we don't have the ability to bond for construction projects. That authority solely lies within the state. So um, we have to compete for those dollars uh, against other campuses and other state agencies, which means we, we really need to think differently, um, knowing that we don't see those trends and getting additional bonding um, increasing. So we need to really start to think differently about how are we going to solve some of these problems. Um, we've started to think about this as more of a four-pronged approach um, and starting to first understand our current portfolio by looking at our facilities condition and space utilization and doing some assessments. And then we're also thinking about how we can leverage other financial strategies um, like utilizing more gift grant funds. Um, we're looking at pursuing alternative delivery options, including public-private partnerships, and identifying, you know, targeted demolition of buildings that no longer really serve our university's mission. Um, so we feel like by doing this, we can match the right type of a project, whether it's maintenance and renovation, or a brand new lab, or, um, you know, academic space, to the right type of strategy, so we can keep moving um, towards improving our facilities and our infrastructure. Really interesting, Marion. You live in a in a private world, not the public world. So you've got this different sort of challenges. What? What? How are you guys thinking about aging there? Um, albeit that doesn't get blown away by a tornado or a hurricane. <laughs> well, one of the things we did, um, we used a lot of the data that we collected over the last few years. Uh, we were actually in in kind of a, a, a new building spurt, say from 2007, 2008 to around about 2015. So those buildings are, are fairly good in, in, in a sense of not, not, uh, not being in the aging process so, so far. But we actually, uh, we went out and we talked to our, uh, we used data to, to speak with our board of trustees and we were actually awarded uh, $100 million to address the aging um, deferred maintenance, if you will. Now, of that $100 million, uh, and everybody was happy, yeah, we're going to do, and, and that probably would have addressed maybe less than a third of our, uh, of what we actually had on the campus. But of that, we've allocated probably $40 million for our legacy buildings, which is probably four buildings on the campus, which means the other buildings on the campus are now going to stop because of that, of that $100 million, $40 million was allocated for uh, the legacy building and another 50 plus million is going to be allocated for a new residence hall. So we're addressing it in one way and we're creating other problems in another manner because the residence hall that we're going to vacate, they're going to still need some help. Some of the other issues like Cindy was talking about earlier, the HVAC systems, we have an aging facility. We have mastered the, the process of using duct tape and super glue, and we have become victims <laughs> of our own success, if you will. So with, with that said, because you know, people say, you know, let's get it done. And that's what we've done. We've been the get her done type type crew, and we've done our best to keep it working, to keep it running. Yeah. But if I don't address some of the other facilities on the campus, then we're gonna come in one day and we're gonna have uh, we're gonna have a situation where we can't plan for maintenance, we're gonna to have to do breakdown maintenance or breakdown replacement, which is gonna cost much more. So we're trying to use the data, uh, data that we've collected to show that you can't, you, you can't just do the shell game. We need some of these other facilities, but at the same time, we need to, uh, when we need new facilities, we probably don't need to use deferred maintenance fund for those new facilities, but maybe we need a capital 
a capital campaign and place more emphasis there. Yeah, really interesting. Landry, you know, I love to hear people talking about data, but I just wonder if you had any other thoughts about this particular topic. Yeah, it does align with data, but um, I'm going to say that not all buildings are equal. Yeah. To every one of you and to our community, are we asking the question, one, not all academic programs are equal? Well, that means that not all buildings are equal either. Um, so how we use our newfound facilities relevance, the professionals relevance to having broken down those silos to way more effectively include um, all stakeholders in the community to have that conversation. And I think part of it, Pete, is having that conversation using data so that data reporting and data analytics helps you understand it, but it also helps others understand it and drive the kind of decision making at the senior institutional officer level you need. But that means that you have to utilize it for, um, for prioritization. Oh my gosh, prioritization means trade-offs. And so therefore we really do have to have strong leadership. I can see Cindy smiling. I can see Marion smiling. Oh my word, yes, leadership and discipline to address the portfolio as it relates to your community, the, the community's culture. Pete, you and I talk a lot about the shape of the community and its culture and how important it is and how you address these very issues to connect space and place to drive um, the strategy behind what your building should be delivering for the recruitment and retention of students is going to be so critical and same with your faculty. So those are just a few thoughts, Pete, to um, add to the sort of national uh, context of what our members are seeing they're needing to do. I think those are great thoughts and I'm, I'm smiling a little bit inside because a number of the things you talked about show up in our report this year um, for anybody who's downloaded it and scanning it and not paying attention to us, they're still getting the same information. So that's uh, that's awesome. Um, let's let's pivot a little bit and kind of talk not just about the aging, but the issue of space, right? Um, the the pandemic has gotten us all thinking about space. Certainly, national and local uh, trends are they're going to vary, but there's no doubt that no matter your position, schools are struggling to find the money to care for the space on campus today. We saw that in some of the images I showed, and it doesn't matter if you're the most wealthy institution in the country or the most challenged. So. I mean, coming out of the pandemic, looking at the future with potentially fewer students on your campus, new understandings of, you know, teaching and learning and uh, work um, and the inevitable constrained financials that come from the, the way forward. But what's the thinking on campus uh, about how much space is needed going forward to meet the needs of the community? And Mary, I kind of want to throw this back at you. You were just talking about the stress of caring for what you have and then the pressure to take money out of your coffers to build new. Like, What is the thinking? There's no right answer, but what is the thinking right now about how much space is going to be appropriate there at Xavier or our colleagues you're talking about, right, going forward? Like, what, what, what's, what's in the mindset of the institutional leaders, you know? Well, for me, I would tell you this, Pete, that anyone that can tell you that they know exactly what tomorrow is going to bring in terms of space utilization, either they are brilliant or they're not. <laughs> and so, I mean, because what the pandemic has taught us in many cases is that uh, some spaces are, are spaces can be transitional uh, or transformative. And what do you say about that? In many cases, we use some some classrooms. When we had empty classrooms, we used those classrooms as study nooks and things of that nature. So I was at a school board meeting uh, last week, and one of the things we talked about is is as they were building, uh, and this was a K through 12, as they're building spaces, they need to build space so they can be transitional so that we can have additional things in there. When they're not a class being held in there, what can you have in that particular space? I saw, I think what the last couple of years or so have taught us is that people who are space harder, academic space harders, these people, this is my classroom, this is things of that. And many of those people have been allowed to uh, to do that because they've been at the university uh, a million years, right? So now well, those spaces are now back into that space inventory for us to utilize however we can because it's no more theirs. And the next thing I think is, is that I, I couldn't tell you how much space we're gonna use next year and next week because where we've talked about virtual classrooms now, you know, we talked about it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. 
all of a sudden it was here in 2020, in May, 20, uh, March 2020, it was here. And then we say, okay, we're going to come back, but then we got to do hybrid. So anybody who tell you that they know exactly where we're going with space, I would, uh, I wouldn't bet on them. But I, they either brilliant or they're not. So. <laughs> <laughs> Cindy, I know you guys are thinking about expansion in some regards, but you're also talking about contraction in other ways, right? I mean, so the space is all over the place for you, right? Yeah, space is a little bit all over the place for us because, I mean, we, even though you've shown demographically that the number of college applications is going down, um, we've not really seen that. We're a little different. Our demand and enrollment has been continuing to grow over the last few years. We've seen record numbers of applications and you know, we're seeing as such an increase for campus housing um, and where are we going to put all of these freshmen as, as they come in. Um, additionally, you know, while maybe that side is changing, our research is increasing. So as a research institution, we're continuing to see the increase in demand for lab space. So it's how are we renovating our spaces to be able to accommodate that increase in research. Um, it certainly doesn't mean, you know, to Marion's point that we're putting our head in the sand. You know, we're constantly evaluating our buildings, how our buildings are, are being utilized and how are they matching the needs of that school, college or, or division um, to support the campus's mission. You know, so we're constantly thinking about that. And that's why we've kind of embarked on this strategy I was just talking about, because we need to be working with the students, with the faculty with the programs to make sure that they have the right type of space and understanding what type of renovations do we need to do um, or where do we need to build new? You know, what are we missing so we can compete, um, you know, in some of these programs? I, I hear you both talking about flexibility, right? The ability to kind of flex and be responsive. And, and I, you're pointing out something that's particular to, to, I would say all research one institutions, Cindy, this, this kind of ongoing growth. And if we go back and if we were to look at that original slide, actually I can, I can, I have the power to do this. Um, if we go back and look at this original slide, right, you do see that the 2000, that 2007 uh, peak in births shows up in the middle of this decade. So we are expecting to continue to see this surge. The question I think that is being faced for everybody is, do we prepare for the peak or how do we deal with the peak knowing that it's going to change in the future, right? And where do we position in the future? And if you dig into, uh, as I read uh, Professor Graw's work, you see that some institutions will actually continue to thrive going forward. The majority of institutions across the country are gonna struggle, but there will be institutions that will thrive. And the question is, how accurate can you be? To Mary's point, how, 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 how good a prediction can you make about whether you're the institution that's gonna grow or the institution that's not gonna grow um, in the face of all of that? It's really, really interesting. But Lander, I, I was thinking about a comment that you made uh, recently about optimization um, in terms of space. And I wondered if you wanted to expound on it at all. Um, just, I know, I know you'd like, uh, that, that quote you have borrowed uh, from a colleague recently. Yes, I have borrowed this from Jim Jackson at University of Nebraska Lincoln. I think it really is quite brilliant. Um, and he says, yeah, space utilization, yeah. We utilize all of our space, don't we? And then he says, but how do we utilize our space? And is it optimized? And I love that phrase. So I want to give you the image of go into any faculty member's offices and Cindy they have more than one right? and look at how they're utilizing their space they're utilizing all their space they got papers on the floor they got stuff everywhere right I'm utilizing my space but are you optimizing it and that I think is such a critical point in the middle of all this we have an opportunity uh, I just uh, I'm re I, I think it's really fun that uh, Marion said hoarding <laughs> space hoarding that you're now getting that space back now that you're getting this in in more of a centralized role can you think clearly about how you really want to optimize the use of that space so that you're actually offering some carrots I mean space is such a difficult one without thinking about how I actually use space as a carrot rather than a stick um, I think we're going to gain a lot more um, in ways that we deal with this now Cindy and Marion are in a perfect position to say, we're going to be fine, Pete. <laughs> Enrollment's going to do what it's going to do. We're going to be fine. They are going to be fine, but the rest of the United States and Canada is not going to be fine. All right. The 
elites and the national four years are probably going to be fine. And it, and Pete, you and I have talked recently about it's by choice. They can choose whether they want to grow, whether they want to expand, whether they want to contract, what they want to do, get the right space for the right reasons, do surveying, et cetera. There are a load of institutions out there that will not have that option. And so I'm speaking for all of them that this is a moment in time in which we need to seize the opportunity to consider how we utilize our space in a way that's optimized and in a way that really addresses um, what the baccalaureate and master's degree granting folks said. We do not have physical spaces that match the existing spaces that match our need going forward. I think Cindy and Mary and you were both talking about that and how important it is to arrive at that. So, um, Pete, I think it's going to be critically important for us to seize the day um, and seize the moment as we move forward to reconsider the way in which we're dealing with space. And then you haven't even talked about remote, right? Oh my gosh. I mean, there's right. so much of this uh, remote hybrid. Rah, rah. So back to you. Yeah, right. I, mean, I mean, it's interesting, right? The, the pandemic as instigator uh, is something kind of under underpinning the, all of your comments, right? We, we we learned to collaborate. It's an interesting thing that we learned to collaborate and work really well together and share. I, I'm i thinking of a of a colleague of yours who's on the campus there. They're learning to consolidate some things that used to be spread out everywhere. And they're like, we don't need 37 and we need six good ones. And everybody can share that resource and on their campus and they can get much better equipment or much better technology or much better toys in those spaces and use much less space for the same purpose. And um, that's the challenge too, is, right, is the distribution. I hear people talking, I got, I got you know, six offices over there and two labs over there and a conference room over there. And how do you, how do you recapture them to really optimize the use of the space when it's so distributed the way it's been? It's not an easy challenge, but uh, it feels like, uh, as you're talking about this notion of flexibility, that and the, and the leadership that facilities um, uh, people have uh, gained over the last several years, that maybe we can uh, leverage that to kind of drive a, a more thoughtful uh, move forward, right? More thoughtful move forward. Um, I, I, I started to hint a little bit at the campus that was thinking about technology. I, I guess I want to throw a technology question out to all of you. Um, and uh, Lander, heads up, I'm probably going to ask you first, but I want to, I want to, have you take a few seconds to talk about which technologies you see having the greatest impact on campus going forward? And uh, there's not a really right answer, but you know, it could be an impact on teaching and learning. The technologies are changing the way remoteness is happening or that kind of experience. Maybe it's a management tool for your organization that has you rethinking how you, you know, efficiently use your team. Um, I, there's certainly huge amounts of technology in building operations, right, and systems, right, that we're that facilities leaders are responsible for. Um, Maybe it's social media changing the way you interact and what expectations are and how you communicate. I mean, maybe that's a that's a technology. Um, uh, I was thinking uh, jokingly that that maybe it's just SpaceX giving you a ride to Mars so you can escape all the stress and just get away from all this. That would be a cool technology, right? Um, I, I want you to think freely. I guess is what I'm saying. Like, wh like what technologies do you think are the most important and most relevant for you going forward? I mean, Lander, you want to you want to take a shot at that because I know I know App is thinking about it. Yes, we are, and uh, I think that Mars is going to be more stressful. So, women from from Venus, men are from Mars. So there you are. Um, in a sentence, touche, touche. Had to do it. Building technologies that enhance the occupant's experience. That's the line that I think is so important for. What building technologies are we using that actually enhance the occupant, the user's experience? To me, this is about um, user productivity, about user effectiveness. Yes, it's difficult to measure, but it's not impossible in today's environment. I mean, what I'm going to yeah. suggest, APA launched a productive smart building task force on purpose, and they're focused on 10 foundational elements and 10 smart technology components to measure this and focus attention on um, this need. It's going to give us, I think, um, data to then correlate to other data sets and really get a good sense of of the way in which that parlays into um, my building condition, for example, and um, my um, highest use spaces, these kinds of things. So I think this idea behind productive smart buildings to ensure that we're enhancing the occupant's experience. So it isn't a focus on how much money can I get back to solve my capital renewal problem. 
it's not your capital renewal problem, it's the institution's capital renewal problem. It's the institution's risk. If we can put this into a different sort of frame and language, I think it's gonna be really helpful. Pete, I liked that you connected the dots um, in the beginning of this to intelligent classrooms, to remote hybrid learning, to remote uh, and hybrid teaching, to um, remote work, um, the tools and the flexibility in that vein, because it is gonna tie to another question that you have, I think. so. Um, I'd love to hear from our colleagues what uh, they are experiencing. Back to you, Pete. Yep, Cindy, Marion, are you uh, thoughts about about the technology? Sure. Um, I guess I agree with you, Lander. I think we we really are are going to have to evolve. We're we're getting requests for lots of data, building condition data from our control systems, and, and making sure that we're able to evolve with our programs with technology. But we're also seeing. You know, we're seeing autonomous uh, food deliver delivery service, you know, so we're, we're looking at, well, how can we leverage that with the workforce decline, you know, we, we can't get as, you know, how do we leverage technology to servicing our buildings? So we're thinking about uh, autonomous, you know, vehicles for snow removal and, and grounds uh, vehicles, you know, if, if we can find them, right, that, that do that, but we're we're constantly looking at those types of things to, to fill the gap. You know, we're we're thinking about um, how do we use technology with drones to survey all of the exterior envelopes. Um, you know, that's having an impact on the facility side as well. Um, we recently are have also installed an automatic tube cleaning system in our heating plant. So how do we become more sustainable? And the technology that is evolving in that universe. Um, is really, really important and make, makes us more energy efficient um, because that's also really important to um, how we, we run our facilities, how we operate them, the data that we're collecting, as well as what are the needs for the, the students that want to come here and the researchers. They're, in, they're interested in it all of a sudden, right? So they really want to yeah. know how are you optimizing your facilities and how are you um, how are you meeting these these challenges? So we're really starting to to think out of the box. Yeah. And from our our standpoint, I I um, I was teasing with my daughter last week because uh, uh, you know during the time of pandemic, she was in graduate school and she's had several different jobs. And I told her she's becoming a zoomologist. Basically, because you're zooming all over and you're you're just working it, and, and all of us have actually become zoomologists, if you will, uh, because of uh, of the of the virtual world that we were forced into. Um, we say we were preparing for it, but it just all of a sudden just came um, without uh, without us really being prepared for it. So, in, in, and I think we're looking now at virtual work and virtual learning spaces. But that goes back to what both my colleagues were saying there. We need good data. Good data is going to be the driver as we move forward. Now, with technology, and again, um, at a meeting last week, with technology, there are going to be some situations that's going to come that's scary. And what I say by that, I'm saying uh, cybersecurity. Uh, in a meeting last week, um, and we talk about budget and things of that nature, how many of us actually is budget? Uh, has put into our budget some some insurance for cybersecurity. So what does that mean? That means that there are people without new technology. There are people who are sitting around figuring out ways to actually penetrate your firewall, your firewalls, and get into your security. Get into whether it's grades or or, or medical information, uh, financial data. So now we have to not only figure ways to keep those people out keep the bad guys out, but we also have to figure ways to train the people to utilize that data and that knowledge on the, on the other side. And on top of that, you have to find some funding, which is gonna fill into your operating budget, some funding for, funding for cybersecurity. So now technology is a good thing, even if you're a, 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 a poor zoomologist like I am, but technology is a good thing, but we have to be prepared also because there are people out there who want to, uh, who want to manipulate our data, who want to steal our data uh, and, and, and create problems for us just because. 
you're, you're reminding me yesterday that I, I was reading about people using blockchain, um, you know, the sort of tech under cri cryptocurrency to, to do all these services. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, the same way, like I've got to learn some new way to manage information by understanding blockchain, which is, I, I don't know about all you, but it's, uh, it's still confusing to me. Um, we cannot leave this conversation without talking um, about the challenges to staffing and budgeting, budgeting, which were the two biggest responses coming out of the survey in January. There were the two biggest responses today to the survey or the pressures facing people. Um, something, you know, what are the, what are campus leaders saying? I, I, I have a sense, I know what you are thinking about those stresses, but what are campus leaders saying? How are they coming to understand the pressures and what do they think can be done to deal with the, the budget challenges and this great resignation issue, which is affecting everybody. And I think we feel it exceedingly acutely within the facilities realm as we confront, let's call it what it is, the aging of the workforce uh, within facilities and not a whole lot of pipeline coming in of young people who wanna be custodians and sheet metal workers, right? So what 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 is the leadership of the campus thinking about these things right now? Maybe you flip it back to you again, Cindy, to, as, a, as a place to start this conversation. Certainly, um, yeah, I mean, we've been talking a lot about it recently and um, really trying to figure out how do we compete for the limited employee pool out there? How do we attract folks with, um, you know, either remote or hybrid um, work where we can, um, especially since we're a, a residential campus? Um, you know, as we think about exploring new recruitment strategies, we're looking at internships, apprenticeships, and, you know, postgraduate rotation programs, you know, how do we implement some of those? But it's definitely a big issue. Um, I don't think we've solved it, right? I think we're all trying to deal with this right now. So I'm, I'm really curious to hear how other people are, are thinking about this. Is there going to be support for, for training and development? I mean, you talked about that a little bit. I mean, it's it, it, it interesting people to understand that you have to develop your people and help them grow. And, you know, is that going to be part of that work you're doing? Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking about uh, training, development. Um, how are we, you know, how do we retain employees by thinking about the training and development? What, how do we create paths for them within, um, you know, facilities so that you don't feel just stuck here, that you have the growth opportunity to take classes or job shadow or, or think about where, um, where you want to go. Think about success, succession planning, right? Um, right. You know, as our aging workforce is, is getting closer towards retirement, identifying those that may be more interested in a management track. Um, and tried to start with them early to say, well, how do how do we think about that? Right. It's an interesting idea to think about the facilities organization as as much of a learning environment as the rest of the campus, right? In that regard, you can get the support. And Mary, what's going on there in in Xavier? And, and this is really interesting, as uh, I just came from a meeting earlier today where um, young lady is actually re, re, uh, she's resigning. She's resigning because she she's going to get a job in Oregon. Now she's not moving, but she's going to work. Marion, we can't hear you. Marion, Marion, we can't hear you. I can't hear you. No, Marion lost his uh, his audio connection. I think. Lost you. I know it means that Marion, with people hope that you would lose your voice, but this is not one of those. So, Lander, do you want to um, add anything before uh, when Marion's searching for his uh, voice, as it were? Yeah, let's see uh, if Marion, because I'm really interested in what ha happened <laughs> this with this person. Um, yeah, I would. Um, suggest that there are um, both hard technical skills and human skills. People want to call them soft or essential skills, whatever they want to call them. They're the human skills that are critically important and highly relevant as we move forward. They are the ones that will transfer and move forward. Um, the skill sets, uh, I just wrote an article for the Facility Manager magazine, did a lot of research on this very topic. Um, and it's called Skills in the Future of Work. Uh, and not because I wrote it, but because a lot of people contributed to it. Uh, and it really does give some ideas around this and the issue that we're facing, especially with respect to women 
um, uh, women are have been uh, particularly impacted negatively by the pandemic and with childcare and lack of support, et cetera. So it's really difficult. I would um, suggest that when we think about jobs, Cindy, this is back to your comment. When you're thinking about those job descriptions, think of those job descriptions as they're written for the future the job you are going to want to fill down the road as your succession managing, as opposed to the job that the person's sitting in. Because we're finding faster and faster with change underneath our feet that it's forward looking, futures focused. Um, and the last thing is uh, research tells us that people will come because of the professional development that we provide to them and the career pathing. I love hearing what you're saying about that and they will leave for the same reason. And it's not just millennials. So if we can continue to sync that up, I think we're in much better, in a much better position. And finally, as apprenticeship programs are trying to fill some of these trades skills gaps. So Marion, do you have your audio? I think so. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, and, and just a quick story. I, I was talking about that, you know, I was in a meeting earlier today and a young lady, uh, young lady, well, she's been here 15 years. She has two small kids and she's actually accepting a job in Oregon, but she's not relocating. Um, she's going to be working virtually. She's going to be working from home. So those are the type of things we have to deal with now. And those jobs are, you know, those, you know, you see, uh, and I have no idea how you do it, but they have project managers and things of that working virtually. Now with us, it's going to be a little bit difficult to have a plumber or painter working virtually, but you know, we are still going to have to be faced with paying people a, a, a better wage than where we were previously. Uh, a few, well, right at the end of last year, my building services had a 33% uh, vacancy. And in, in, and in the central plant, we had 55% vacancy. Um, people retiring, people finding other jobs. But we have a guy who says, I can go and be an Uber driver and make more money than in a week than I can in a month, whether it's Uber Eats or whatever. That's a problem for us. We need to look at what we are delivering and can we afford to continue moving in this direction. And the same thing, uh, you know, when there was a, 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 a need for uh, truck drivers around the nation, where did they come? They came for, they came for our people. So uh, I, I think it's going to be an issue that we have to look at what is it that we want and, and what we're offering is just not going to invite uh, those young people to come in and the number of people retiring. So we have a hole we have to fill and we have to get creative with it. Thank you. Um, I understand my audio is a little bit uh, scratchy too. Um, my apologies for that. Um, the hour has gotten astonishing late very quickly. We do have some questions, but I'm thinking I'm making an executive decision here, Amanda, that um, maybe what we'll do is we'll we'll respond to those questions um, afterward. We'll we'll take those questions up. We'll get back to everybody who submitted a question to us, uh, Mary and Cindy and. Amanda and I will just check in on the answers to those and we'll get you uh, something comprehensive and send it back to everyone who submitted a question. And we can also, I suppose, post those somewhere as well, Andrew, so people can read those about this, uh, about this right now. Um, so to, to maybe uh, bring this whole thing to a close, one, many of the things, I'm delayed, many of the things that I was hearing from this conversation actually are part of the closeout section of the report, um, which is kind of summarized here. And I am uh, hopeful that as people read through the document, they're going to find um, additional thoughts and ideas in the report, but also affirmation of what we've been hearing from the city, uh, Mary and Andrew, uh, today about what's happening. Um, and I, I know I was hearing a lot of uh, convergence um, in what you guys were suggesting and what, what's in the report. Um, and um, so we'll, we'll make sure, make sure, yeah, remind everybody once again that uh, the uh, report itself is available in the handout section on the right hand side of your screen. Download that uh, once more. Um, you can also uh, check out that state of facilities report. Um, we downloadable on the onboarding website at the ninth edition section of the website um, at that address. Um, and I want to just say thank you so much for the three of you joining us uh, for this year's version of the kickoff because it's been so much more interesting than hearing me ramble on for 45 minutes talking about the report. Um, so much more informative, um, and I really appreciate you taking time away from uh, the crazy busy days and uh, the uh, arduous weather circumstances in various cases that you're all facing. 
Um, and I look forward uh, to being able to uh, spend more time with you guys again uh, very, very soon. So um, with that, we're bringing this thing to a close. Um, all the appropriate things. I love that Nelson Mandela quote. Um, and uh, thank you all for attendance uh, today. All right. Thank you, Pete, for leading it. And Cindy and Marion, as always, you're amazing. Thank you. Take thank care. you. I love yeah. the little hearts that are coming up. <laughs> <laughs> See you? Right hand side. Whee.